Good morning. Happy Father's Day. The best holiday ever, right? So if you are a dad in the room, a, a father, a grandfather, great-grandfather, father-to-be, or were born from a father, happy Father's Day. Um, uh, our topic today is it takes a father. It takes a father. And to begin, I want to read some startling statistics to you. The fact of the matter is these are statistics, so they're facts and they're irrefutable, but they will be disturbing. Here's the first one right here. 63% of all youth suicides come from youth who grew up in a fatherless home, a fatherless home. 71% of all high school dropouts are of kids who grew up in a fatherless home. 75% of teen chemical abuse patients from a fatherless home. 85% of all children with behavioral disorders from a fatherless home. 85% of all youths in prison, 85% of all youths in prison from a fatherless home. And finally, 90% of all runaway children are a byproduct of fatherless homes. These should be sobering. They should be irrefutable. But you know what they are most of all? Politically incorrect. These are the most politically incorrect statistics you will ever hear because they assume two things. That a mother in the home is simply not enough. And that is not a dig on mothers. It's just that a mother by herself is not enough and that a father is needed in the home, period. You know, I think we actually intuitively know this. We know that these facts are true because I think we have this innate desire in us to have a father present in our life. We do. We have this longing. Uh, when I was a, a young man, I had this longing. I grew up uh, the child of a father who was an atheist and mom who was agnostic. My dad left when I was about two. My mom remarried again, divorced again by the time I was about 12 years old. And yet, when I was about 12 years old, I suddenly realized that I had this longing to have a dad around. Because at some point, I think our souls long for the experience of a man in our life. Men, you probably know this to be true, and ladies, you know this to be true as well. We have this longing, this innate desire that's, I believe, inbred into our soul as we navigate this life. So when I was about 12 or 13 years old, I remember going to my mother one day and I remember saying to her, Mom, I want my dad to spend more time with me, meaning my bio dad. And he was now kind of out of the picture, except for these every other weekend obligatory visits that he would come pick me up for where I would go over to his house. And over at his house were things that I never should have been exposed to as a kid, but they were there, and he was my dad, so that's the experience that I had. Over there, there was an experience, and at home with my mom, there was an experience, and, and I kind of knew that after my mom had been through a couple of failed marriages that I just wanted the presence of a man in my life. So I went to my mom one day and said, Mom, I want to spend more time with Dad. Over the course of a number of weeks, she tried to actually convince me not to do that. She tried to dissuade me. And looking back on things, I understand them a little bit better now with hindsight. But at that young age, it was just so reckless. And I was so desperate for it. I kept coming back and coming back and coming back again. And then finally, one day she caved. She says, okay, I'll talk to your dad. So literally, he came over to our house one of, one of those week, for the, one of those weekend visits. He picks me up. I kind of anticipated my mom talking to him at that moment, but she didn't. And we drove away in the car. I spent the weekend with him, came back on Sunday night. And Sunday night as we're making our way back home, I see my mom waiting outside the door for us to arrive. Uh, I wasn't expecting that, but there she was, and she begins to make her way out to the car to talk to my dad. And I, in anticipation of this, was sent by her into the house so she could talk to dad. So I went through the house, out the back door, around the garage, 
out the side of the garage to listen to the conversation. Because by the way, this is the first and only time I had ever seen my parents together in one place. I thought time was going to stand still right here. I thought I was actually going to repair their misrepaired marriage. And so I eagerly listened next to the garage as the conversation kind of ensued. And I watched as my mother leaned in the side of the car window, began to kind of have a conversation with my dad. After a few minutes, it kind of erupted. My mom stood back from the window. They began to argue. And then next, I heard words that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. I heard my dad shout, I don't want to spend time with him. You spend time with him. And then he drove off. That was the last time I ever physically saw my dad. I went back into the house. My mom came in the front door. She gave me some kind of sob story, but within the next week or so, I told her that I didn't want to go back over there ever again, and I didn't. It was a devastating moment for me, of course, because I knew that I needed a father in my life. Because, gentlemen, ladies, it takes a father. It takes a father. There are some things that only a father can do that only he can impart. And guess what? God knows this. God knows it takes a father because these statistics are irrefutable even today. And so Jesus, while he walked the earth, told us a story about a father because Jesus knew it took a father. In fact, today we're going to read the greatest story ever told. And I'm not over embellishing that. This is hands down the greatest story ever told. Luke 15, beginning in verse 11. We're going to look at that today. If you have a Bible, you may want to open it up. I'll read it from the screen today. But this story is it's astounding and it's humbling. And we got to remember that Jesus is in a place at this moment where he's being confronted by Pharisees, religious leaders, about the time that he spends with people of irrefute, tax collectors and sinners, and so Jesus is going to tell them a story. And I always forget this about Jesus, but Jesus didn't have a lot of notes in front of him when he told these stories. And by the way, he made them up on the spot, but they're that good. They are that good. So here is the story we know today as the prodigal son, which I think is a story very inappropriately named. And he said, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. So there's this image here that he's beginning to paint as he tells this made-up story of a father with two kids. But remember, he's talking to religious leaders, to Pharisees, and they can, they're probably okay with this part of the story, at least the first sentence. Because as he tells them the story, he's asking them to imagine a Jewish father with two boys, which is honestly the ideal situation for a Jewish father. He's got a couple of boys. He's building his empire. He's building his heritage. He's building his name. And then next comes this. And the younger of them said to his father, so there's two boys. The younger comes to his father and says, Father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. Now, this is a ridiculous, preposterous statement. So as Jesus inserts this into the story, he's insinuating that the younger son came to the father and said to him, I don't like your way of life. I don't like the things you do. I don't like the things you say. I don't like your beliefs. I don't like your worldview. I don't like your system. You know what? I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead. Give me my share of the inheritance. Which, by the way, is something that a Jewish father would do on his deathbed. On his deathbed, what a Jewish father would do is divvy out his estate. He would give a double portion to the older son and a single portion to the younger son and divvy it out to him. It is something only done on his deathbed because to a Jewish father, this was everything, everything to him. His land, 
His property, his inheritance, his cattle, his money, and his boys were all a part of his identity and his image. But this father does something quite interesting, and he, that father, divided his property between him. Now, no Jewish father would do this. I want you to know this. No Jewish father would do this. So now you can kind of imagine that the Pharisees that are in the room that are hearing the story are going, okay, that's preposterous. That would never happen. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took off to a country, into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. So here's what he does. He takes his father's property and goes to Vegas. Goes down to New Orleans, right? Heads off to Amsterdam. He parties it up, and he squanders it away. All of it, gone. In what, days, months, week, weeks, who knows, but it's his way of doing life. He, this kid thinks he's got it all figured out, right? So he takes what's his and he leaves and spends it all in reckless living. Next. And when he has spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So you can imagine this moment, right? Supply chain gets all messed up. Gas prices go up, inflation, chicken farms are being burned in northern Minnesota. I mean, however you want to imagine it right here, there's a severe famine in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Now, I think Jesus kind of does this on purpose here, obviously, He's poking at these guys by inserting swine into the story. And if you don't know Jews, you don't know that they don't like swine so much. Swine are unclean to them. They wouldn't much less come close to them, much less touch them or work with them. Now, I'm a bacon guy, and that's my love language. Like, you cook me bacon for breakfast, I will love you forever. In fact, I woke up this morning hoping for bacon. But I came here. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And there he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. So I want you to imagine this situation because now this guy has gone from the top of the food chain to nothing very, very quickly. He has hit right at this moment rock bottom because not only is he working with swine, smelling like swine, touching swine, he wants to eat what the swine are eating. He's that, at that point of desperation, he's, he's desperate, he's hit rock bottom. And I would assume that there's people in this room today who've hit rock bottom. You know what it feels like to be here. It was different for every one of you, but you've been there because you know what that feels like. It's a feeling of hopelessness, of utter hopelessness, and you don't know what to do. You're at the point where literally you can't care for yourself anymore. But, the text says, but when he came to himself. What happens here? All of a sudden, logic kicks in. His mind starts to work again because all of a sudden he realizes that his way doesn't work. And the unfortunate truth of this part is this, is that for many of us, pain is our greatest teacher. Sometimes for some of us, pain is the only teacher, which is totally unfortunate, but pain helps us to re-engage logic, to re-engage understanding, reason, to think again, he came to himself and he said to himself, Self, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? You see that? He's beginning to reason about his basic needs. These are basic things. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, this is where it gets so good. Because now he is preparing words in his mind and it begins to disclose where his heart is at. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Right here in this moment, we see a truly 
willing, repentant son who's willing to even lay down his identity. He realizes that he's sinned against God. He realizes that he's sinned against his father. And he realizes that there is no hope other than his father's mercy and grace. That's it. So he's willing to abdicate his sonship for a piece of bread because he wants it that much. Then he says, treat me as one of your hired servants, which is to say to him, I would love to be treated as a nameless, identityless man who is undeserving of anything, even an inheritance. I will work for you for bread. Man, this is an incredible moment because now he's going to bring himself to his father. And it says, and he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. Now, I would assume at this moment, the Jews who are hearing the story think this is preposterous. They think that there is no, they know that there is no way that, they would, that a father would allow a son who treated him that way back into his home, much less wait there standing, looking out at the sunset for the silhouette of his boy to come home, much less feel compassion for him, much less run to him and embrace him and kiss him. There's no Jewish father that would do that. So clearly these men that are standing here hearing the story as Jesus is telling it are going, they, this is preposterous. This is a mind-blowing story. So at one point they're okay with it. The next moment they're offended by it. The next moment they're thinking, that's crazy. No way this son was going to come home and there's no way the father would ever act like this. So in their minds, it's just, their heads are spinning, I would assume. And the son said to his father, Father, Listen to what he says. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And then he cuts him off right there. Do you see that? He cuts him off. He doesn't let him get out a phrase that he had prepared. He cuts him off. Because the father hears his repentant heart. He cuts him off. He doesn't let him get out the phrase, treat me as one of your hired servants. He won't let it fall over his lips. But the father said to his servants, as he interrupts him, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now I want you to see this image here because what the father does is even more preposterous than what he's just done. He tells his servants to go get the very best clothing and clothe his naked son. To go get the signet ring and put the signet ring back on his hand, reinstating his sonship. And put shoes sandals on his feet, which is to insist to not treat him as a servant. And then they kill the very best animal in the house, the fatted calf, delicacy to a Jew. And then there's a celebration, this amazing celebration. But the story is intensified by another component. It says this, now his older son, so there's another son in the story we see now. His older son was in the field and he's working, he's busy. And he came and he drew near to the house and he hears this music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and asked what these things meant because he has no idea what they meant because he was out in the field working. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and Sound. And you would think this would be a glorious moment for this older brother, a glorious moment. But it says he was angry and refused to go in. 
And his father came out and entreated him, just like he did the younger son. He comes out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look these many years, I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice he doesn't call him brother, doesn't call him by his name, but when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, which by the way is true, you kill the fatted calf for him. Notice not, it's not a question here, it's an exclamation. This is an indictment on this father. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And then here in this moment, we see this image of a father who loves this other son just as much, wants him to enjoy the celebration, but won't come in. Now, I got to tell you this week, over the last week, as I was reading the story over and over again, uh, I saw something in it I'd never seen before, never seen it before, and it was actually quite beautiful because I would assume you, like I, probably have read this story before. It is the most well-known story ever told by Jesus. But there's all these little components in this story that I think that are interesting, that, that jump out at you right away, but you can't ignore this, that there's two sons. There's son one and son two. And as we read the story of these two boys, we're immediately drawn into it because I think we kind of connect with them in some way. Whether it be with the younger one or the older one, we have this strange emotional connection immediately with one of the boys. For some of us, it's the younger one. For some, it's the older one. But I got to tell you this, it looks like they're very different, but actually they're remarkably similar boys. In fact, the only thing that Jesus paints in the story that they have dissimilar is their ages. One is younger and one is older. That's it. They're actually both very selfish and very disobedient and very in need of a father, both of them. In fact, when I first read the story years ago, I connected with that first son, the belligerent, obviously disobedient son who is very, very self-centered. He thinks he's got it all figured out. He wants to live life his way. He's going to do it better than his dad ever did it, so he's going to run off because he thinks he's got it all figured out. Yet there's that, moment, there's, there's that moment that he kind of comes to his senses, and all of a sudden he realizes, I don't have it figured out. There in that moment, you see and you connect with this self-centered, blatantly disobedient son. But on the other hand, you see this other son, and it's an older son. And his self-righteousness and self-centeredness, therefore, are harder to see because he's busy working, and he looks to play the part. But all of a sudden, in one moment in time, this older son is exposed for who he truly is. And it's in that moment that the younger son comes home. Because what happens when that younger son comes home is that all of a sudden the father reinstates his sonship, which, guess what, threatens the older brother's inheritance. Because remember, the younger son has already spent all he had. When the father reinstates his sonship, in his mind, the older son thinks, now my inheritance is being threatened. And all of a sudden, he gets angry. And why is he angry? Well, he's angry because he doesn't understand that the father has limitless resources. Because he, in his own way, has been 
not working by disobedience to earn that inheritance. He has been working by obedience to earn the inheritance. He just kind of kept it all to himself. He was also thinking, Father, I wish you were dead. But he was going about it in a more elusive and devious and insidious way, trying to earn his inheritance from his father. The strange thing about the story is this, is that I think we're going to connect with either one of these stories at some point in life. But the most bizarre thing about this story is the cliffhanger at the end. We don't know what happens to the older son. Isn't it interesting? Jesus tells a story that has a cliffhanger that doesn't have a season two. And you know why it doesn't have a season two? Because he's telling them the story and looking out at the second prodigal. We call this the story of the prodigal son, assuming that it's only the first son that's a prodigal, but really the prodigal is not the first son. The first son came home. He is no longer a prodigal. The one who we are left hanging with is actually the self-righteous son who has been working to earn the favor of the father whose story is yet to be untold. And Jesus, in the most polite way, is looking out at these guys. He has told them the most offensive story he could ever tell them. It's that God is rich, he loves you, he is generous and full of compassion, and you're working to try to earn his love. And he's saying, what I have has always been yours. Come in and celebrate and stop trying to earn the Father's love. Do you see that here? It's crazy. The people that he's talking to are the prodigal. They are the prodigal. Because guess what? They need a father too, because it takes a father, period. Every time I read this story, I do discover new little idiosyncrasies to it because it's just that good. The precision and the craft of Jesus' teaching here is marvelous, but there's nothing like actually experiencing the story. So I was about 15 years old, and one day my grandfather came over to my mom's house. My mom had been through a couple of husbands at this point. She came to me one day, said she wasn't going to marry anymore, which probably was a good decision, and she just had a lot of boyfriends in another house, and it wasn't doing me much good. My grandfather saw this, and so he stepped in. He came over to our house one day when I was about 15 years old, and this was an unusual sight. And the reason why it was unusual is because, well, because my grandfather wasn't allowed over to our house. He was a God-fearing man, and my mom was an agnostic. My dad was an atheist. We didn't let Christians into our home. They didn't come in. Well, he knocks on the door one day. My mom lets it in. And, and in this moment, I, it's the most unusual sight. So I pretended like I went to my room, but I did the very same thing I did the first time when I was about 12 years old. I came down the hall into the kitchen to kind of listen to the conversation. And my grandfather and mother kind of talked for probably about a half hour. And then after the half hour was done, I heard a very different statement from my grandfather that warmed my heart. He said, I just want to spend more time with my grandson, Vince. That day I moved in with my grandfather. It was an awakening of understanding what it meant to have a father speaking to my life, and over the course of the next months, that's all Grandpa did. Well, Grandpa did two things. He played golf every day except for Thursdays, which was Women's Day which we heard about every Thursday. And then uh, he taught me about God. He spoke to me about what it meant to be a man. Taught me manners at the table, taught me how to treat women, taught me about struggles that he was facing, talked to me about the issues I was facing in life, and taught me about God. I'll never forget one conversation I had with him. When I was about 15, we were sitting in his old 1958 Chevy Apache truck. He had a conversation with me that went like this. He said, Vince, I know that your mom and dad say God is not real because the church is full of hypocrites and broken people. Therefore, God cannot be real. And he said, I need to tell you something. They're right. The church is full of hypocrites and broken people. 
But my faith isn't in the church or in broken people. It's in a man whose life was broken for me, and his name is Jesus, and in him I place my faith. Not in the church, but in a person, not in people, but in a man named Jesus. That one little 30-second conversation turned my world right side up, and I began to see through a whole nother lens because a man spoke into me. Gentlemen, I hope you're listening. Because a father spoke into me. Grandfathers, I hope you're listening. Because a grandfather spoke into me. Because guess what? When a man speaks on behalf of God, things happen. That's what happens. In fact, back up to the beginning of time. God created by speaking. Think about it, speaking. He spoke things into existence. The very first thing that God creates is light. Light. He spoke it into existence. And guess what? Even today, the very first thing that God spoke into existence, we still do not understand. You can go to some of the greatest schools in the entire world, country for that matter, talk to some of the greatest physicists or scientists, and yet they'll still argue today about whether light is particles or waves. And they still don't have a conclusion about it. Why? Because things God creates are mysterious and incredible. They're beyond our understanding. The very last thing that God creates is man. Man. And then God stood back. And went, hmm, very good. And yet still today, we still don't understand man. We're confused about it because we pursue it in our own way. Do you know there are only four ways that a man pursues his identity? First one, through gender. The second one, through rite of passage. The third one, through status, position, title, the fourth through virtue. And each one of these attempts at discovering manhood are failed because we try to do it within culture ourselves, by ourselves, like these two young men did because we think we got it all figured out. Maybe it's through self-centered disobedience that we pursue our identity in Christ or it's through self-righteous behavior thinking that we can earn our identity in Christ. But neither one of those paths work because guess what? There's only one father who imparts identity and we ain't it. Because guess what? In the story, notice there are only sons and one father. Now, gentlemen, if you are a father-to-be or a father in this room or a grandfather, you bear a title for a period of time, but you need to know this. There is only one father, and you're just kind of playing a role that is a tiny little reflection of what this father has done. Because really in the story, the story here is not about the sons at all. The sons are just kind of a part of the tension of the story so Jesus can paint a picture of a single father, the father of all mankind, the father who created the first son and the first daughter, the first man, the first woman. And we are just part of his procreated order, Trying to find not a father in time and space, but find one outside of this place. Because guess what? I have come to learn by being a father myself that I am not perfect. There is no measure of my own obedience that's ever going to sway my own children to love me like they need to love that father. Because there is only one. And guess what we get from that one father? Everything everything. Limitless riches, limitless inheritance, grace, mercy, love. And in this story, everything including an identity that only a father can give and it comes in limitless quantities. And he's waiting for his children to come and receive it. That's it. The story is partly about you, yes, 
but you are not the center of this story. God's love as Father is the center of the story, and he's coming for his children in the most loving way. So when I was 17, I kind of went my own way. I thought I had life figured out. I became the belligerent younger son. I made a decision for Christ, but I ran away from that because I saw what my mother and father were doing, and I thought that maybe I should chase after that, and I chased after their ways for about a year, and all of a sudden, I had a moment that I came to my senses. I came to my, my senses again because I had finally hit rock bottom, and we don't have to go into that day, but you know what that place is like. I was there at this place, and the only place I knew to go was home, to Grandpa's house. That was it. I knew that maybe there was a chance that he might accept me back into his home. So I hopped into this truck right here. This is a 1959 Volkswagen bus. It didn't look that good. This one looks really good, by the way, but it was very similar to this. And I was from California, so, you know, basically I had a cut up bus, right? That's what that is. For me, I packed all my belongings into this truck because I was a long way from home, about 300 miles, I only had one problem. This truck was stuck in second gear and I was 300 miles from home. But I packed everything up and I put it in this Volkswagen truck and I cruised at an easy 26 miles an hour down the freeway <laughs> for five hours. It only took about 30 minutes for the little air-cooled engine in the back to start heating up and blowing smoke out the back. So I turned the little heat box on in the front to relieve the heat off the engine. So smoke's coming in the cab. I'm sweating it up. I opened the safari windows to let some air in. And I'm just cruising home. And the whole time home, I'm wondering, will my father accept me? Will my father accept me? Will my father accept me? And then I turned on the little transistor radio as loud as I could because I could barely hear it over the 4,000 RPMs on the engine in the back. And this poet comes on the radio, and his name was Bob Dylan. And the song was Rolling Stone. And I had this spiritual moment with God where all of a sudden I connected with Bob and God in this Volkswagen truck. And I begin to weep like crazy. Cars are flying past me, kind of looking in at the mysterious side of an 18-year-old boy crying tears in the front, listening to a transistor radio with the safari windows open, smoke coming out the back, and I'm sure it was hilarious. I eventually got to my grandfather's house and pulled this old truck up in front of my grandfather's house, and I turned it off, but the car wouldn't go off. It was so, those 36 horses in the back of that truck were so worn out, it wouldn't stop. It was just engine idling. It's like clunk, 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 and it wouldn't shut off, and I'm like, oh my goodness. This truck is never going to start again, but I slammed on the gas one time, flooded it with gas, and it died. And I sat there, and I put my arms on that big steering wheel, and I put my head down, and this was the hardest moment I've ever had in the 52 years I've walked planet Earth, because I knew that I had to make the trip from that seat to my grandfather's front door, and I was unsure if he would accept me completely unsure of this moment. I sat there probably for a couple of minutes and then I got out of the truck and made the walk to the house. Hardest walk I've ever made. I felt so full of guilt and of shame and of regret as I was thinking and reasoning. Even though I'd come to my senses, I didn't know if I could make the walk and I make the walk up the little pathway to his old 1940s home and and there's this big picture window behind which sat two lazy boy chairs. One was for Grandpa and one was for Grandma. And I saw Grandpa sitting back in one, all leaned back with his feet up, see his bald head still shining in the light today, his arms behind his head. He was taking an afternoon nap after golf because it wasn't Thursday. And I make the walk up there and I kind of put my head down. I look back up and, and there he has vacated the chair. The lazy boy is kind of rocking kind of wondered where he went and then all of a sudden as I make my way up the stairs I'm on the very first step I look and he opens the old yellow door and there he is and he looks down at me and he just smiles and then he turns his head to the kitchen where my grandmother was cooking dinner and he makes this statement that I didn't understand at the moment he said grandma our son has come home and then he just opened his arms like this and welcomed me into his home. 
Not much of a word was actually spoken that entire day. We just kind of sat in each other's company. Grandma cooked, we ate. After the end of the meal, we sat in silence, watching a little TV. Grandma went off to bed, and Grandpa said to me, Welcome home, but things can't remain the same. Changed me forever. A son come home. I realized in that moment that I actually saw a reflection of God in my grandfather, and because of his unconditional love in that moment, I saw God for who he truly was, a loving, compassionate, gracious, merciful God waiting to extend identity to me, which is what he wants to do for every one of us. There is only one Father, and gentlemen, you are not it. It's God's job, it's his role, it's his resources, and it's for him to give, and he's ready to give it to belligerent, pig stinking, disobedient younger sons as much as he's willing to give it to cleaned up perfect, self-righteous, older sons, the only question is, are you willing to become a son? That's the question. Are you willing? And there in the story is the cliffhanger, the story of a God who waits. So guess what? There's only two responses to God's story here. There isn't a third one. There's only two It's either we come home for the first time or we come home again. That's it. And what we are all longing for is a better father. Everything that you've experienced in this life here around your father or wish you would have experienced or have experienced or everything that you want to be as a father perfect as it may be or as imperfect as it may be, doesn't make any difference because you are only a tiny reflection of God the Father and it's to Him we must come. And so today I want to give you that choice. Today maybe this is a moment to come back to the Father for a first time or to come back again. And Doug's going to come at this time and lead us in a song. And I want you to reflect on this right now because it's a serious decision. Because there may be a person, a son or daughter of God that may want to come back to him today. I just want you to reflect on these words with us as we sing. And then after Doug leads us, I'll come back up to pray. thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been
pray together. God, we thank you for being the Father. You're the only one that could do it, parent us, wayward children. God, your patience is incredible, your mercy is never ending, your grace we still don't understand. God, we're on a journey through this life trying to discover you. Sometimes we get in our own way. There are people in this room who have gotten in the way of your riches by thinking that we could live our own way. Some of us in this room have pursued you by self-righteous behavior, hoping to work and to earn a relationship with you. But God, you're willing to allow us a celebration, an eternal celebration and you extend us the invitation. God, today we receive that invitation and there are some in this room that need to make a first time decision to become a child of God. If you are ready to make a decision just like that in this moment right now, will you do something hard for me? Will you just stand right where you are if you're ready to make that decision? You can just quietly stand as we keep our eyes closed. Just stand as a, as a, as a confession of walking away from an old way of life and coming to a father devoid of identity, with sin, ready to walk away from a life of disobedience. If there are people in this room too who behave like the older son, we, we have been trying to earn the Father's love, we, we know that the Father lo loves us, but we have been trying to work to earn righteousness, work to earn his love, that we've looked to all the wrong things to try to manufacture obedience. God, we, we stand against that today by declaring you are Father. If that is you today, would you just stand up for me right now? Stand up right where you're at. Just stand from your seat as a declaration of that. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Welcome home. Thank you, brother. Welcome home. As I continue to pray, if there's anybody else who wants to stand, just stand right now. I want you to imagine that God the Father is standing at the door of an eternal home. He smiles down at us and he says, look, my son and daughter has come home. I want you to imagine right now that he embraces you, but know this, life is gonna change. Life is gonna be full of challenges that are gonna attack you as a man and as a woman but you're gonna have a father with endless riches that's going to walk with you forever. So Jesus, today we culminate this service by praising your name for giving us an opportunity for being our savior and Lord, for justifying us by your righteousness, for taking the sin of all humanity upon yourself on the cross. God, we believe that you're Lord and savior of our life, for those who are standing, we proclaim this. Your Lord, your Savior, hallelujah, we praise your name. We declare today a new day in Jesus' name, amen. Can we